This video will be about motivation in online learning. So let's first talk about what is motivation. Motivation is that which drives us to action. It comes from Latin for to move. So to motivate a student is to help them move. Often discussions of motivation talk about extrinsic and intrinsic motivation. Both rewards and punishments are extrinsic motivations, whether explicit and agreed upon in advance, such as grades and detention for students, or implicit and assumed, the reaction of the crowd to sports or other performances. Intrinsic motivation usually derives from feelings of satisfaction and fulfillment, not from external rewards. In education, intrinsic motivation is usually talked about when students are willing to learn for the love of learning itself. More in-depth discussions of motivation often warn against accepting a clear distinction between intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Any time a student feels motivated in a class, it is often a combination of extrinsic rewards such as grades and intrinsic motivation such as how a particular assignment or class fulfills their long-term goals. There is nothing wrong with using grades and tests and quizzes to help keep students on track. But when we can move students to intrinsic motivation, where they become very engaged in the content, that often leads to better learning and a better learning experience. Much will depend on the content of the class and the subject. For example, I teach a first-year seminar on vampires and find that students are intrinsically motivated to learn more about vampires. When I teach public speaking, some students are intrinsically motivated to get up in front of a classroom to speak while others are not, but most of the students in public speaking often need some extrinsic motivation to appropriately prepare for being in front of a class. The issue of motivation is one that is significantly different between in-person and online learning. Two of the major challenges of online learning include that students need more self-regulation in order to be successful without that face-to-face -face meeting in the class. Additionally, research shows that the completion rates of online classes are lower than in-person classes. So both self-regulation and lower completion rates both point to issues of motivation. Michelle Miller writes, it's easy for students with motivational barriers to simply avoid engaging with the course. And that is from her book, Minds Online. So it's important when teaching online classes that we plan for how to motivate students and engage students to keep going in the class. So the rest of this presentation, like the other videos that I have created, will focus on tips for motivating students in online classrooms. In every source that I have found about motivating students, they all talk about the importance of emotions. Sarah Cavanaugh wrote a book called The Spark of Learning, in which she writes, Tapping into emotion will harness our students' attention, dominate their working memory resources, enhance their long-term memory consolidation, and fuel their motivation. James Lang encourages us to focus on a very simple lever that psychologists have established as a powerful pump for motivation, emotions. So some examples of emotions that are in the classroom include trauma and stress, which reduce executive function. Calm and good feelings can lead to students being able to tap into their creative resources and cognitive dissonance can lead towards curiosity, and curiosity is a powerful motivator. So you'll notice that some of these are negative feelings and some of them are good feelings. Cognitive dissonance can be something in the middle as it's quite uncomfortable, but the satisfaction of getting through it feels really good. So it's important to point out that it's not necessarily good feelings that lead to successful learning. Different feelings lead to different types of learning activities, which Sarah Cavanaugh talks about in her book, Spark of Learning. Things that educators can do in terms of promoting good emotional states for learning include showing compassion and empathy in a time of trauma, having a warm and personal teaching presence, using humor when appropriate, establishing curiosity, which you can do by giving them one piece of a puzzle, such as a picture or an archival document. This is a picture of a phrenology machine, which I have used in a psychology class to try and get students curious about the history of psychology. 
And finally, we can show enthusiasm for the subjects that we teach. I remember participating in a study where the interviewer asked me what makes a good teacher, specifically when thinking about my favorite teachers in high school and college. And I remember suddenly realizing what I remember about my high school biology teacher and my choir teacher and a really wonderful astronomy teacher that I had in college was how much enthusiasm they had for the content that they teach and how much they shared that with their students. And that enthusiasm was infectious. So sometimes professors can think that showing that kind of enthusiasm may be unprofessional, but there are ways of sharing that enthusiasm which can get students engaged in the content. Another important motivator is feedback. In chapter five in Small Teaching Online, Flower Darby describes an online class she observed her husband take where there was no feedback. It took an enormous amount of motivational resources to finish that class when he felt he was submitting his assignments to avoid. She also talks about how online learning has a major advantage over in-person teaching when you can set up multiple choice quizzes online that students can retake as often as is necessary. And these quizzes take a while to set up, but they can be reused, or you can use question banks from an open educational resource repository. These quizzes can be graded by the computer and can include feedback on each answer. Another important aspect of feedback in terms of motivation is that the feedback we give on students' work should focus on growth mindset which particularly means focusing on the amount of effort they put into a particular activity as opposed to saying that they're simply good at something. This encourages them to keep trying and keep pushing through difficult learning activities. And there is a lot of research by Carol Dweck that shows this leads to much better educational outcomes. Flower Darby and Michelle Miller both talk about the importance of choice and control. Flower Darby writes, when students feel like they have some ability to control or have a say in the process of completing their work, they're more likely to find that work meaningful. So some things that professors can do are provide a choice in online discussions so that students have to respond to a prompt, but they have a choice of which prompt to respond to. Professors can offer choice in group work topics so that there are a list of topics that students can sign up for. Flower Darby also writes about OOPS tokens, where her online students have a token that they can turn in if they are late on an assignment or aren't happy with a particular grade on a paper, and they can turn in that OOPS token for grace. And if they don't use the token by the end of the semester, they can get some extra credit points towards their final grade. Flower Darby also talks about annotating a syllabus at the beginning of the semester where students can have a say in how the course is run by making comments on the syllabus. And as you create lecture videos or content videos, allow students to have the ability to pause and rewind and control the pace of those videos. The next tip is to focus on social connections. We are social creatures. Also, our students didn't choose online learning when they chose Like Homing College, which may make online learning more difficult for them. And connections between people are harder in online learning where students and professors both may feel like they are alone with their computer, but it is possible with some planning. So the first is to focus with social connections between you and your students. And you can do this by creating introductory videos where you introduce you as a person at the beginning of a course. You can focus on being a humanized instructor. This may mean sharing some of the things in your personal life that are affecting your work when they are appropriate to share with students. Being in the Zoom or Team class 15 minutes before or after a class, which may be used for social time to ask students how they were doing or to be able to answer questions outside of class time. And also you can connect with students one-on-one -on -one to talk about their work a few times throughout the semester. Flower Darby talks about this in her book, Small Teaching Online, and says that you can do it for all students throughout the semester, or you can focus on meeting with students who seem to be struggling. Additionally, you should focus on helping students build connections with each other. 
You can do this through course discussions, both synchronously in Microsoft Teams or Zoom or through discussion forums. You can also have students complete group projects or have them divided up into smaller groups for discussion, either in a particular class or assigning students to a discussion group for the semester. And just as you created an introductory video to introduce you as a human being, you can have students create their own introductory video or audio introductions that they share with the class in the first week. This can help you and students to feel like you are all in a classroom with other human beings and not simply anonymous Moodle profiles. The next tip is to engage students and motivate students through storytelling. Sarah Cavanaugh writes that stories are psychologically privileged. In The Spark of Learning, she also writes that one of the best predictors of whether an event or information will be remembered is how emotional it is. So professors can present the class content as stories when possible. For example, if you are sharing a lot of statistics about a social issue, you can balance those big picture logical arguments with what that means to an individual person through newspaper stories and videos and other texts. Additionally, you as the professor can tell stories about how you or someone else overcame a learning obstacle you were facing at the time that students may be facing now. So the next tip is to focus on content connections. We already talked about social connections between people in the class, but now we're talking about content connections. You can help students make connections between course content and, first of all, what they already know. This may be at the beginning of a course, helping them to realize how much content knowledge they're already bringing to that course. Also, throughout the class, as you start new units, you can take time at the beginning of each unit to invoke relevant information from earlier in the course before presenting new information. And as you consider how students are learning information, look for ways to design for building connections between pieces of information Particularly, how can you design learning activities where students do the work of building these connections? This takes planning on the part of the professor, but leads to deeper and more meaningful learning. And when students see learning as meaningful, they are more motivated to do it. Also, when you validate the information that they already know when coming into a new course or unit, that is also a powerful source of motivation. So in addition to connecting course content to what students already know throughout the course, you can also help them by connecting the content to their lives, their world, perhaps through connecting the content to current events, and helping students see how the content in the course is important to meeting their goals. James Lang calls this invoking purpose. And finally, the last tip is to consider games and simulations. I have spent over 10 years studying game-based learning and gamification, and they have a lot of potential for learning. I believe we all know what games are, but gamification is turning something that's not a game, such as a tutorial or some kind of learning activity, and transforming it by adding game-like activities, which doesn't necessarily turn it into a game, but it does make the learning activity more engaging. So you can design your own games or a gamified activity, and this can be a lot of work. Or you can use existing games, which may be educational or may be commercial. So in some of my classes, I use a number of games. One of my favorites is Snake Oil, which is a card-based party game, and I use it to teach persuasion and audience and also understanding characters in fiction. I also use Monopoly Junior to illustrate some of the principles of capitalism that are being criticized in a short story that we read. My husband, David Broussard, has used the BBC's Big Al game in his lab before and was very disappointed when they discontinued that game. So with the exception of Big Al, all of these are in-person physical games that students would play face-to-face. When I imagine how these could be moved online, it's easiest to start with looking to see what other people have already created. So Merlot.org is a very large open educational resources database that not only includes course texts, 
but also includes many other types of resources. When I searched for game, I got over 1,500 results. Additionally, there are many popular, easily accessible games online, including Monopoly. And don't feel like all games have to be high-tech. There are many low-tech solutions with some creativity, such as having students print out some kind of paper avatar and taking a picture of that avatar to prove they were at some type of place relevant to the course. Or they could find an image and submit it to the class in some kind of game-like activity. And finally, staff at Lycoming College have been playing Family Feud in Microsoft Teams. And so there are options for games that don't require planning, but can just be played when people meet together synchronously online. When using games and simulations, Remember that they are pedagogical tools, and just like any other activity, they require careful planning for how you will introduce the game and integrate it into the content of the class and help students understand how to play it, as well as debriefing activities after the game is played so that students clearly understand how it relates to what you want them to learn from that activity. If you have questions on using games in your class, please don't hesitate to contact me. At the end of this presentation, I want to introduce the four books that contain the vast majority of the suggestions in this presentation and have a lot of information on motivation and engagement. So the first book is Small Teaching by James Lang, and he divides his chapters into three parts, and part three is all about inspiration. The second book is Small Teaching Online by Flower Darby. In particular, chapters 7 and 8 are Creating Autonomy and Making Connections. The third book is Minds Online by Michelle Miller. In particular, chapter 8, Motivating Students. And the last book is the entire book, Spark of Learning by Sarah Kavanaugh, which focuses on the affective aspects of learning. All four of these books are available as ebooks through the Snowden Library, and you will find links in this guide to those books. As always, please don't hesitate to contact me if you have any questions, and thank you for watching this video.